Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night's class. Uh, thank you, Hashem. It's nice to be back. Hashem shall further. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you, Hashem. It's nice to be back. Hashem shall further. Shall have the physical health to be here on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on. We went through Pesach. I didn't really speak about Pesach, and then Sfirat the Omer, and we're almost, you know we're halfway to Shavuos already, and there's so much happening that we missed that I missed out on. Uh, and a world in chaos, and, 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 and. So I want to actually take a twist on everything combined, maybe in a unique way a little bit, to go down to the core. So, during Sfiat Omer, we always talk about Tamidei Rabbi Kiva. In previous years, we explained at length, um, sourced, the whole thing behind Tamidei Rabbi Kiva, right? The Gemara says that Rabbi Kiva had 12,000 pairs of students, and they all died during one period, in prior years, we pointed out that it doesn't say he had 24,000 students, he had 12,000 pairs. The Marsha and others write, the Maralos has a long piece on it, that it was deliberately wrote that way to show that their unity was so much that they were considered one. Each Chavuta, each two that learned together, were literally like one. So it definitely wasn't a sin in Ben Adam or anything of the sort. It was much deeper than that. Um, but anyway, they all died. Um, we explained, I think it was last year, how could it be that if one person dies, so the Gemara says, if one person dies, so everybody has to make a cheshbon on nefesh, why Hashem did it? So they had over 800 funerals a day. After the first 800, they didn't try to figure out what's going on. We explained that in prior years too. But out of all the questions on the subject, there's an interesting question that's not a question of learning, meaning to understand the learning. It's more of a question, an emotional question, that we can learn from for life. And that is, after all that happened, 24,000 students have Akiva lost. He still had the strength to get up, pick the pieces up, and build five more. That From that we have Torah today. How? Came out of the valley of death. He went to 800 and something funerals a day. And after all that, he didn't give up. He didn't surrender. He didn't say, obviously, God doesn't want what I'm doing. He continued on. And he built five students that the whole Torah that Am Yisrael has ever since pretty much came through them. Where does a person get such strength from? So I want to make an assumption. And again, if you want, we can argue the psychology of it and source it with medical stuff and whatever, but I think it's common sense, and honestly, when things are, have common sense to them, that to me outweighs any research that I'll quote. And that's, if somebody's whole with what he's doing, and whole with who he is while he's doing it, there's nothing that'll ever stop him, including the greatest tragedy. And I think that's just simple common sense. I don't think we need it. I can rattle off research from here to tomorrow to prove it in many different angles. But I, I don't see the point. I think it's a waste of your time. Um, and if you disagree with that common sense, then I'm more than welcome to hear, uh, I'm more than open to hearing why not. But, and everything I'm going to say is literally based off of this assumption. I think mankind's flaw at large, and as individuals, each of us go through some period of time that we have the same situation, is that we begin to doubt either ourselves our surroundings, a combination of ourselves or our surroundings, or at essence, we're not whole with society at large or the way we lead our own lives. And from there, the road down is very quickly, meaning confusion is the prime cause of everything. One of the greatest drives of people to do really stupid and evil things is jealousy. Uh, the only reason why billionaires are busy fighting with each other like two-year-olds even though they should be very content and proud of their accomplishments in life, is some absurd jealousy. I'm worth 1.8 billion and he's worth 2.5, so I hate him. It's an absurd thing. But Chazal said that, right? Mishnah uh, says, Akina v'atava v'akavod, but we're talking about Akina for a second. Motziet ha'adam in ha'olam, even the greatest man, it'll make him crazy. Hey, ha'adam beheidiyah, even the greatest person. Why would a person be jealous? As a young child, I remember naively a asking one of my rabbeim, I don't understand why the Mishnah talks about jealousy. Why would somebody care what somebody else has or doesn't have? Why would you ever be jealous? This didn't make sense to me. 
uh, it was completely removed from anything that made sense in my naive child mind. So he, I remember what he answered me. He said, when you grow up, you'll understand. And I hope and pray you won't. But over the years, I grew up. I didn't, Baruch Hashem, understand jealousy is not something that I struggle with. But um, I did explore it because I saw that the majority of the world does struggle with this very frequently. And I realized a very interesting thing. The less a person is secure and whole with who he is, the more he cares about what other people are. The more a person is whole with who he is and is content with who he is, so what do I care? Somebody who's better than me, worse than me, happier than me, sad than me. My, my, let me focus on my life. What does it make a difference what somebody else's life is? It's a very interesting thing. So why aren't people content? Because if we can crack the code of being content, so then maybe we can crack it all. So I, I, I don't have the... Well, I do have the answer, but I, in 40 minutes or so that I have energy for tonight, I don't think I, can, I have enough time to explain the entire code. But I want to explain one element of the code, and maybe over the next year in different contexts we'll be able to put little pieces together. I also think there's a limit to how much one can absorb at once of deeper things. Naturally, a human has a need to understand. Why? I don't know. Hashem made a person that way. Uh, why is very simple, because otherwise nobody would ever explore and learn. In order for the be, to be a drive to, to grow in anything, definitely in academia, um, you have to have a natural desire to understand. You see a young child, when it, I don't know what the age is that they start playing with Lego blocks, they don't just play with Lego blocks, they experiment with Lego blocks. It's very interesting to observe, there are a lot of studies written about this. They try building it this way, and then that way, and then the other way, even if they are at the age that they have the perception of how to build it the right way, meaning the way to get to the end game of what the manufacturer intended it for. That's not out of a flaw. That's actually out of a good thing. That Hashem made a person in a way that he has a need to understand. And the child, in his way, he doesn't know how to express himself, asking his mother, why if I put the blocks this way, it looks like a house, and if I don't, it doesn't. So he keeps on trying, assembling these same uh, blocks or Lego pieces in different ways, because that's his way of hands-on learning to figure out in his mind what's proactively going on. When people face either great struggle or great joy in life, the underlying struggle is the lack of understanding. Am Yisrael suffered throughout the generations greatly. Um, the easiest uh, example to use of recent history was World War II. And the greatest challenge for the survivors of the Holocaust was understanding why. How could it be that people can be so evil? And why were we targeted as Jews? And where was God? That was their greatest challenge. Some passed the challenge with flying colors, and others failed them miserably. But one way or the other, those who had a perception of understanding, even if the understanding wasn't, was flawed, or if the understanding was faith-based, were able to move on and to build a life. Those who didn't struggled much greater. And the same thing in every situation. And that's why sometimes it is important to be aware of that need and to address it and to try and understand things. And not always to live with one day I'll know or one day I'll understand. Or if you do want to live with that, at least understand why one day you'll understand and not today. But at least to get that far. Because otherwise you end up sitting in the same dead end over and over again. Hashem says in the, in the parashiot now, different in Israel and America, but parashat Doshim, Hashem commands Am Yisrael, Doshim to you be holy, ki kadosh ani Hashem elokechem, because I got him holy. In prior years, I said, if, any, if there's any mitzvah in the Torah that I don't really think that we have what to worry about after 120, it's this one. Because I have a very simple answer to this. God, of course you were holy, because you're God. I'm not God, and I'm not holy. It doesn't... Eh? It's like, imagine a father goes to his son, who's three years old, and says, be a neurosurgeon tomorrow morning, because I'm a neurosurgeon. <laughs> he may be a neurosurgeon one day, but it's going to take many years. And, and with God, God's eternal, so it'll never happen. So the, the parallel of be holy, because I'm holy, doesn't really work so well. And that's why the Rishonim, each one in his way, Rashi and others, said that it doesn't mean be like me, it means make boundaries, do other things, live within a context of some sort of restrictive norm. Uh, 
all different ideas in order to explain how a person can emulate something that will bring him closer to God. But in the simplistic wording of the Torah, it doesn't seem to say that. It seems to see, say that Hashem says that a person can emulate whatever he, this holiness is. We have memchet kinyanim shat Torah niknet bahem, 48 conditions, contingencies. There are clauses in the contract between God and the Jewish nation that a person can acquire Torah. And we have 49 days of Sefirat Ta'omer, can negate the 48 days and one day to review them all to make sure we got them right. The 48 things, the majority of them, are practical behavioral things. Sleep less, eat less, study more, behave in better ways, many, many characters, traits, all things. You know anything else that in order to learn you have to have all 48 things? If an Ivy League school would have even the most minimalistic condition to get in, nobody would ever get in. They can't even have a condition that you have to fill out on the form if you're a male or a female because they don't know themselves. And there's nothing left anymore. And, and that's supposed to be the elite of academia. And in Biblic study, in the Torah, is memchet kinyanim. Kinyan means the only way to acquire it. That means if you don't have even one of the 48, then you might know a lot of Torah. It might be a very beautiful philosophical study, but you didn't acquire it. You don't have a real connection to it. I remember my Rebbe Zechot Tzadik Levacha once we were talking about boys and girls that went through the yeshiva system and not those that had a negative experience, which unfortunately sometimes happens. Those that had a positive experience. And later on in life, took a completely different path that seems to be very far from Torah on every level. Um, one of the words that I heard freak, recently, frequently, was I'm not as spiritual as you. I'm not sure what that means. Everybody has a soul. So we're all equally spiritual by definition. Maybe it's not convenient for you to behave in a spiritual manner. That would be a little more honest. But we're all equally spiritual. So I was once talking to my rabbi and I said, why is it that... Those that had a negative experience, because unfortunately they had teachers or whatever that maybe did things that weren't so right, or spoke to them in negative ways and broke them instead of building them, simply put. Fine, I understand. That's a, an emotional response to a negative experience. But those who had a positive experience and have only nice things to say about their upbringing, why do they fall to the wayside? And I said, and don't give me the answer, Yetzirah, because Yetzirah we all have. And we choose how we want to deal with it. That's a, that's a very simplistic choice. Um, it might be hard sometimes, but it's still a simplistic choice at the core. So why is one like this and one like that? We know many G'dolei Israel throughout recent history that had brothers that were close to them in age. That one brother became a G'dol Torah and the other brother became a G'dol Apikosim. And they learned in the same yeshiva, were raised in the same home, so over there you can't say that one's this, one's that. They had all the same circumstances. It's an interesting thing. So wh where does this come from? And you know my Rebbe answered me, he said very simple. He said one had memchet kinyanim and one didn't. If you have the memchet kinyanim, so you become Gdol Torah. And if you don't have the memchet kinyanim, you can learn in the same yeshiva, the same Bet Yaakov. You can know all the same information. You can have exactly the same positive experience. But the outcome is going to be different. Because you simply didn't acquire it. There's a difference between one who owns a billion dollar company and one who works in one. One who works in one is rolling a billion dollars a year, if not more. But they're earning 60,000. One who owns it actually has an ownership and wealth. Somebody who has Memchet Kiyanim owns the Torah. That's the Talmud Chacham that the Gemara says that he, Hashem said about them that he so, I don't know what to say, glorifies them that Ani Gozer Gzira Hashem says that I make a decree they choose to nullify it. God committed himself to listen to the words of the Tzadikim. And then there are others that have the Torah knowledge as well. But they don't have the Memchet Kinyanim. And as a result, there's no ownership of the Torah. And from there, the road down is very quickly. 
And that's why these Memchet Kinanim are very substantial. And that's why Hashem gave us seven weeks devoted prior to Matan Torah in order to study them, understand them, absorb them. And if Chazal Akdoshim structured based on the way Hashem said Shiva Shavuot Tispolach, that we should learn the Memchet Kinyanim, that means it's possible to do. Chazal wouldn't tell us advice that's not possible to acquire. Right? Nobody would ask their two-year-old to change the tire for them. Because the two-year-old can't change the tire. So if Chazal Akdoshim said that you have 49 days in order to acquire the Memchet Kinyanim, in order to be able to have ownership of the Torah on the holiday of Matan Torah, that means it's doable. It's not far-fetched. Years ago, there wasn't the stupidity of, I'm not on that level yet. Chazal said, that's it, you could do it. Today, that's the easy way out of everything. I'm not on that level, I'm not on that level, I'm not on that level. Somebody asked me on the phone yesterday, uh, not yesterday, today actually, um, if I can describe, they said they want to get closer and be more observant or whatever. If I can describe like some sort of criteria of what the standard should be. I, I don't know, it's a very interesting question. Like, it's a very personal thing, what, do you mean what the standard should be. Stick to the truth. Find out the truth and stick to it. I wasn't sure what to say. But I saw the person came from a very pure place, and so that you have to answer something, because otherwise they give up quickly, unfortunately. Hashem put words in my head. I said, you know what the standard should be? Any excuse that wouldn't work with the IRS, don't use for God. I didn't think before I said that. It came out sporadically. But you know what? I thought about it afterwards, after I hung up. Somebody didn't pay taxes, and they ordered him. I wonder what they're gonna, if they can send the response in. I'm not, I wasn't on that level. Or I wonder if they can send an answer that my father was abusive when I was a child, so therefore I decided not to pay taxes today. I suspect that that wouldn't fly with the IRS. So with Hashem, it will. I don't know, the whole thing, yeah, I have to think about it. So, if Chazal Akdoshim said that there are 48 ways that we can learn in a seven-week period to acquire Torah, that means we literally can do so. But we have to at least answer ourselves some of the basic things in life. And the first thing is to take ownership over our actions. The greatest tragedy in the liberal movement is not the hypocrisy and not the corruption and not, these are all tragedies. But it's, it's a lot deeper than that. It's based on one and only one thing. I am not at fault for anything. Criminals come from lower income backgrounds. One big lie, but that's the theory. These people were racially profiled against, that's why they behave this way. An excuse for everybody and everything. So there's no standard left in life. If there's no standard, yeah, go be a low life. That tragedy is what later on brought all the rest of the tragedies. When they got to their confusion of their gender identity and their this and their that, it all came from this core. The simple thing of, this is who I am and this is what I have to own up to. And this is where I have to keep myself honest. It's easier said than done for one reason. Because in life, the Rambam in Mor Nebuchim talks about this at length, the Rambam was bothered by how could it be that God created evil in the world? Hashem is all good. So how could Hashem make evil? And the Rambam simply writes that the Rambam, Hashem never made evil. Man made evil. And man didn't even create evil. Man just chose not to be good and the lack of good is evil by definition. Yeah, I'm saying deep things in seconds, but whatever. You're all brilliant, so I'm not worried. What does that mean? What's the outcome of that Rambam? That what I do good, I do good to myself. And what I do bad, I do bad to myself. Could be on the way other people benefit or, or get harmed, God forbid. But in a moment of truth, Adam nivra a person was created for himself. And that's called taking responsibility. Nobody owes you anything, nobody has to provide you with anything, nobody has to do anything for you. You have to do everything for yourself and stand strong for yourself and create a person. 
לפיכך האדם נברא יחידי, חז"ל עושה. That's why a person was, man was created alone. Hashem didn't even make a husband or wife at the beginning. He just made one person. To teach mankind a lesson forever, assume responsibility for your actions. Without that basic thing, you can't grasp anything in life. You can't get even one inch closer to Hashem or to Torah, to anything. Even as a go, you can't be successful in anything. Because there's no, there's no end to the blame game of deflecting responsibility going on. I'm not going to say this about Tamidei Rabbi Kiva because we have no grasp of anything of what Tamidei Rabbi Kiva were. Forget about to talk about what sin they had, quote unquote, or whatever. We were never given the tools to even think about such things, forget about it, understand them. But today, just a few hours ago, in Elad, a Haredi town in Israel, there was a terrorist attack so far, and I hope it stays at that. Three people died, and many more injured in the hospital. They don't even have an exact number yet, because there was such chaos there. Hashem should help. They should all have a flush in my... Elad, it's a Haredi town in Israel. Years ago, there was always terrorist attacks in Israel. Israel from day one was at war, and we always will be at war because the Goyim hate us. Definitely the Muslims. There's no family love. They're our cousins, right? The Muslims are our first cousins, but they don't love us. What should we do? And the more we try to make peace with them, the more they're going to hate us. Because they sav son Eliyakov, it's alacha. That's just the way the world works. But years ago, and I'm not saying there's a right way of thinking, there's a tragic way of thinking. We used to say terrorist attacks happen in Tel Aviv. But in from towns, there was nothing. In Jerusalem, yeah, because Jerusalem is a very mixed city, right? There's a, a big percentage of the Jerusalem population are Arabs. But in Bnei Brak, and in, in Modi'in, Kiyat Sefer, I don't know, all these places with our Haredi vill- towns, villages, whatever you want to call them, there were no terrorist attacks. And now in a month, we had two, one in Bnei Brak and one in Elad. This is not something that, oh, you're so sad. This is Hashem saying, you didn't want to learn from other things, so you'll, it'll hit your house too. And, and we have to take responsibility for this and say, if this is going on, then something's going wrong by us. Because if nothing was going wrong by us, then Hashem would be protecting us and these things wouldn't be able to happen. And it's very easy to say, we don't have police and we don't have guns and we don't have this and we don't have that. And I said all of that just a few minutes ago uh, when I was sitting and eating pizza. But that's true on a materialistic level. But everything's being zeirat el yon, it all comes from above. So that's not true on a spiritual level. And that means that, that there has, something's going wrong. I'm not God, I'm not a spokesman, so I don't like really explaining these type of things. But one thing I do feel obligated to say. When Jews fight between each other, that's the thing that makes Hashem suffer most, whatever that means. God doesn't suffer, He's not materialistic, but just to put it into human terms. Not only when they fight, even if they just have the tiniest lack of respect, it doesn't mean we always have to agree. And let's differentiate. Beit Shammai and Beit Yilel argued throughout the entire Shas. Abaye and Rava argued throughout the entire Shas, and so on. The Rambam and the Ravid argued throughout the entire halacha, and the Ravid wrote very harsh words about the Rambam many, many times. But they respected each other. Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, even though they considered each other's kids psulei chitun in certain situations, they still married, married off one another because that was a stamp of unity. Why is it like that? It's very simple. Anybody who's a parent, and you should all Hashem help, be parents soon, happy and healthy knows that the thing that will make a father suffer, a father, mother, same thing, suffer most, a mother probably more than a father, because mo- mothers naturally are more in tune to kids' needs, is to see their kids fighting. There's nothing worse than that in the world. And fighting doesn't have to be a big fight. When I see my children bicker over a tiny stupidity, uh, he said, she said, whatever, you know, one of those dumb situations. Silly thing that in 30 seconds is going to be like it never happened. It eats my heart out to a point that it affects me physically. I feel my heart racing. It's torture for a parent to see their children. So, Kaviachol again, we're putting it in human terms because that's the best we got. And he sees his children fight. And unfortunately, in Amisel, there's plenty of that. 
There's nothing worse to him in the world. And that's why whatever the level was, which, again, there's no way to understand that Talmudei Rabbi Kiva, their behavior towards each other wasn't flawless. That was enough of a reason to take him from the world. Because your credibility to be in this world is that you have flawless behavior towards people. Towards your brothers and sisters. Meaning Am Yisrael. Reb Chaim Salavechik writes that really in, in, in the Torah there's no place that it says that if you don't show a huge amount of respect to another Jew, so you deserve a death sentence. There's no such thing. Shabbat, it does say. Chalel Shabbat, Mot Yumat. But this, it doesn't say. So why did they get the death sentence? What it, it's not even encrypted in the law of Judaism. They got a punishment that seems to be way worse than what they deserve. So Chaim Salvechik writes an interesting thing, that they weren't punished. This wasn't a punishment. He said it was a technicality. That really they were going to be the ones who would later on teach Torah to the rest of Am Yisrael. They were the continuation of Torah. And the Torah simply can't pass on through somebody who his character traits are not flawless. So Hashem took them to continue learning in Gan Eden. Death, from a Jewish perspective, is a completely different thing. It's a tragedy to those who stayed alive, but to those who went to Gan Eden, if they did the right thing in this world, it's not a tragedy at all. On the contrary, it's actually a big blessing. I said that after Reb Chaim passed away. Reb Chaim is not, so, he's not sad that he passed away. He's sitting, he, he got his dream. Nobody's bothering him, and he's sitting with HaKadosh Baruch learning Chavrusa. Am Yisrael lost the protection of Reb Chaim being alive in the generation. But, uh, so Reb Chaim says that that's why Talmud Yerav Kivu passed away. Hashem didn't punish them. He took them to Yeshiva Shel Mala to learn, continue learning and continue their lives because he couldn't allow them to be the ones to give over the Torah. Why not? Okay, so they had whatever, again, I stress a million times over, we have no grasp what this was or what happened there. Halavai, our greatest mitzvah should be 1% of their biggest avera will be in good shape. Not good shape, will be in amazing shape. So we have no grasp of what happened there. But whatever it was that happened there, Sashem took them from learning here to there. But why can't we give the Torah through them? Why not? The answer is, is that the Torah is not another chokhmah. It's not another interesting thing or an inspirational piece of information. And it's not even a book of laws. The Torah is Torah Chaim. It's the essence of life. If you skip a heartbeat, you die. In the essence of life, there can't be any flaw. And in the transmission of the essence of life, there can't be any flaw. And the Torah has to be passed on generation to generation by people that Agosh Bochu gives the stamp of approval that these are the ones that fit the bill of all the rules of absorbing and then giving over Torah in the most flawless way. We see in the Gemara in many situations, Tanaim, Amoraim, and others that were in predicaments, whether they didn't feel well, didn't have money, or other things, that didn't blame anybody. And on the contrary, they took the liability on themselves. They went to do soul-searching on where they were flawed. Now, the Tanaim, the Gemara says, Katan Shebaim, the smallest amongst them, Echayem Metim, was able to do Tchiyat Metim. See somebody drop dead on the side, and, hey, get up. Walk to the cemetery, knock on some graves. He misses his grandfather, he goes to the cemetery, takes him out. The Gemara says that. That means kipshuto, katan shubayim chayim the smallest. So what does that mean, flaws? What flaws? What does it mean that they took upon it? What did they take upon themselves? If they were able to be chayim etim, they had to be really great. The answer is, based on a person's level, there's no end to growth. So, dafka, because they were so great, that makes them obligated to even more. And dafka us that were maybe so lack of great. So that's why a few mitzvahs and that's good enough. And that's why Hashem's going to be not so happy when even those few mitzvot we didn't do. So I want to say over a story that I said many years ago, but it's been about 15 years since I've been using it in classes. Back in the day, everywhere I was asked to speak, that was always the request. Could you say that story? And I never understood. So many of those people heard it already a hundred times. Why a hundred or one? But... Uh, as the years passed, and I see how the generation is continuing, taking less and less and less responsibility over their own actions, I understand in retrospect why this story is so important, because it really teaches the element 
of understanding and then also owning up the responsibility. So if any of you know it, I'm sorry, forgive me, but you're a young generation, so it could be you missed uh, 15 years ago's material. I think it's about 15 years that I didn't repeat this. Not my story, I read it in a book, I tell you, you know, I like saying where I got my things from. There's an author in Israel who wrote many interesting books. It's Fadi Bel Tshuva. His name that he goes by, I don't know if it's his real name or not, but at least the name he goes by is Kobe Levy. He writes an uh, article weekly in the At Israeli version of the Ated Neiman as well. Um, very interesting phenomenon. An Israeli Sephardic Bal Tshuva to write in the Ashkenaz Israeli newspaper that even when Mashiach comes, I'm not sure it's going to happen. He broke all the rules that exist. Uh, he has good material. And he wrote a bunch of books. I don't remember all the names of all the books, but the first book he ever put out was translated to English. The only one that was ever translated to English. Um, I don't know the English name of it, but the Hebrew name of it is Haitonai. I guess the news reporter, because that's what that means. In that book, he had two. There's a lot of stories, but there were two that stood out. This is one of the two, which I think has a great message. If my facts are not 100%, I'm sure he also changed a few of the facts, so whatever. It's, it's for the message. It's not, don't nitpick the details, sorry. It's been a lot of years since I read it. But roughly, it goes like this. There was a kid who, Bachshem, came to this world, very nice. Um, and then didn't have such an easy childhood, we'll say. Didn't have an easy childhood because at a very young age, he lost his parents. Children have a natural need to have parents. It's very hard to hear this sometimes, it's very hard to say it, because not all of us had healthy functioning parents. But whether we had or not, whether a child or Alenu was an orphan at one point or not, it's still a human need. And that's why Chazal Dushim say about an orphan that a person has to behave like a father to an orphan. And Moshe says an orphan is not only somebody who biologically his father is not alive, it's somebody who doesn't fulfill the role of a father. He's considered an orphan, al what, And what's the role of a father? Rashi says a best friend. That means there are many Tomim that have biological parents alive. Many, many, many. But that's a human need that will never go away. A person could be 90, and if he didn't have pa healthy, parent, healthy functioning parents when he was young, there's going to be something inside of him that's going to be irking unless he was lucky to have a role model in his life that took that place uh, of a parent and adopted him pretty much on an emotional level. I don't mean on a technical, legal level. And that's why, by the way, Hashem says, Avi Hashem takes vengeance for the lack of care and love for orphans. Because he says these are the they're the ones who deserve and need it most. It's not at their fault that they don't have parents. So the least we can do is have the simple understanding of giving it to them. But anyway, um, this boy is raised at a very young age, both of his parents die. I don't know if it's together or one after the other, but in a very short period of time he lost both parents. A young boy losing both parents we should never know. We should never know. Hashem should help. Nobody should ever know anymore. I knew people like that. Meaning knew. I know. Hashem alive and well. I know uh, more than one. I know one specific person that I spent a lot of hours of my life devoting to try and be some figure in their life that lost both of their parents in a terrorist attack in Israel. Here's a young girl who's in school and has social workers pulling her out of class to notify her that her father and mother just were killed. Shemirachim. Like, I can't fathom things like this. It Today she's a normal, healthy, functioning person with a family and everything. That's because I'm Yisrael Toshimim and people understood that they have to do whatever they can. It's never going to be the same, but at least whatever they can to, not only to give money and this and that, it's way beyond that. Time and patience and guidance and love and everything that's needed in order to bring a person to a healthy state. By law, in, in America, I think it's like this too, but in Israel, this I know for sure, um, the law is, if somebody is a child minor, so the uh, w welfare is obligated to make sure the kid grows up in what they call healthy circumstances. So they either look for a relative that will take responsibility for the child, and unfortunately between the army and terrorist attacks in Israel, these situations are common, or... Israel has a welfare system, whatever, but they told me orphanages. 
My father-in-law was raised in an orphanage. Um, and, an official, and then the government's liable for the kid. But of course, it's a lot healthier emotionally for a child to be raised by a family member. The kid was eight years old, and uh, the government gets involved, and he has a grandmother. Fine, if he has a grandmother, so that's naturally the best place to put him. They go to the grandmother and they say, are you willing to raise your grandchild? She says, of course. They say, you're not young and whatever. Are you capable of doing it? She says, there's nothing a grandmother's not capable of doing for a grandchild. The power of love is way beyond all human capabilities. Sometimes people are in relationships and they say, I love you, but I can't do this anymore. That's a lie. Love is beyond every struggle in the world. And if somebody said they can't do something anymore, then they never loved the person. They lied to themselves that they love. They think they love. They think they understand what love is, but they're not even intelligent enough to understand what love is. Forget about further than that. In Florida, yesterday, a mother killed two of her children. These happen in the United States every day lately. It's like, it seems to be a normal thing or something in this country. And when they... And they arrested her right away, whatever. And the, one of the first questions they asked is, why did you do it? She said, I love them so much that I couldn't see them suffer anymore. And we were poor and whatever. So I killed them. She didn't love her kids. She didn't even love herself. She had severe psychiatric issues. She was crazy. She acted normal and sophisticated. She even had a degree. She worked in a hospital, the whole thing. But uh, she was a mishugana. And a liar. A person who lied to themselves. There's no... To lie to me, lie to me, good luck. It's your problem. To lie to yourself, you ruined your life. The worst liar is somebody who lies to himself, not somebody who lies to somebody else. That's the worst. So, that's, so the grandmother says, yeah, there's no power. Love is the ultimate power. Of course I'm capable. Sorry, this is not me looking at my phone. I don't have a watch. So if you don't want to get out of here at midnight, then you need me to see the time. But anyway, um, I'm, yeah, send the kid. Kid eight years old, goes to live by his grandmother. We'll call him Moshe. Um, and he goes to live by his grandmother. Baruch Shem, it looks like uh, under the circumstances working out. A little school, a little this, a little that. The grandmother tries her best. Whatever it could be, is going to be. And uh, the kid grows up. But, you know, some people have unlucky streaks in life. He was one of them. So he lived by his grandmother for a few years. Lo and behold, one day the grandmother's not feeling well. Combination of illness and age and it doesn't take long, and she passes away too. And now he lost his father, his mother, and grandmother, all in a few years. And he's still under the age of 13. Obviously that messes with the head a lot. Uh, at that point they didn't find any other relatives to put him by or whatever, they put him into one of these government institutions, an orphanage, and he's being raised over there. Shalom Adah. And uh, the years go by, and very quickly he becomes a troubled kid, because somebody who's raised without healthy functioning parents become troubled kids. Today there's no idea, of, there's no more troubled kids in the world, right? Because everybody should be whatever they feel, so. Instead of fixing a problem, we created the problem even bigger. Now it's, a, it's like having a hole in your roof and it's raining and the, and the house is getting soaked and I don't have a hole in my roof. I live in a swimming pool. That's what it means to take apart a family or to let kids grow up without parents. Uh, and it's okay, it's all okay in the name of liberalism. Each one should do his thing, his way, his this, his that. I wonder if that mother who killed the kids yesterday, she was also doing her way. In Eicha it says, Yedei nashim rachmaniyot bishlu yaldeihem. The hands of merciful mothers murdered and cooked and ate their own children. When people are in unhealthy mental situations, they make crazy de decisions that impact their children in terrible ways. But anyway, the kids in the, in the government system, the government system is not flawless. My father-in-law told this to me many times. There are many flaws in the orphanage system. They mean well, but at the end of the day, it's not their kids and whatever. It's very commercialized also. And at one point, one of the social workers that's working with this child and trying to keep him in the right way decides that uh, maybe if somehow they can locate some sort of relative, even a distant one, that's going to be in contact with the child, the fact that he knows he has a relative that cares about him, will nurture him emotionally and will help him a little bit heal. There is a concept like that. It's actually a very smart idea. They do a lot of research and 
they see an interesting thing, that they missed the most obvious relative. The father of this boy has a brother. And he doesn't live in a foreign country, he lives in Israel. And for years, they sent him to the grandmother, this, that, and he's unspoken about it, nobody heard of him. So the social worker reaches out to this uncle and speaks to him, and he sounds to be a very normal person. And asks him, you know, so why weren't you involved in your nephew's uh, life? And he says, I didn't think they wanted me to be. It was a family dispute many years ago, and I thought they didn't want me to be. So she says, well, now there's no family left. You're the only family. Are you willing to be involved in the kid's life? He said, of course. I'd do anything in the world for the kid. The social worker scored the lottery. This is exactly what they need for this child. So she talks to him and coaches him in and updates him on the kid's history and what he needs and what this and what that. And then says, I'm going to go speak to the child. It's going to take a while to get him ready emotionally for this. But we want you to have an initial phone call, then a meeting, and to get together. And he says, I'm all in, gladly. No. He, uh, they made up that this boy is going to call his uncle for the first time. An Erev Shana. That's the way it worked out with the calendar. It's also a holiday, it's a good time. It's also a chachma to that. You always make a first call on anything at a time that's a busy time. Because like this, if it goes well, so you make the effort, so you could stretch it a little bit. And if it doesn't go well, at least it doesn't backfire, because it was a busy time, and that's it, you know. Couldn't talk for much. Kibit picks up the phone, calls his uncle, Erev Shana. He says, hi, Itzik, that's his uncle. He says, yeah, who's speaking? He said, your nephew, Moishi. He says, oh, Moishi, what do you want? What do you want? What do you mean? They're preparing this guy for months. He said, I just wanted... He was stunned, the poor kid, because he was told how his uncle's looking forward to hearing from him. He said, I just wanted to wish you a Chag Sameach, Shana Tova. His uncle said, okay, Shana Tova, and hangs up. That's worse than the death of his parents already. The kid later on said over, when he wasn't a kid, he's a known speaker today, just under a different disguise, um, that at that moment, he wrote off the world, society, God, normacy, anything. He wrote, everything was written off in his mind at that given, in one second. He said that was the straw that broke the camel's back completely to a crazy extreme. You know, the social worker asked him, how did it work out? He said, nothing happened. What do you mean, how did it work out? And he blamed her, of course, and cursed her out. And said, what? So it wasn't her fault. She tried her best. Something went wrong. She tries to reach the uncle to see what happened. Like, what type of crazy thing is this? Didn't we speak so many times? What did all those hours go for? Uncle's nowhere to be found, not picking up calls, not returning calls. Mystery, the whole story. No, but life has to go on. Life goes on, but now he's angry and resentful, worse than he was already. And when a person's angry and resentful, it's a formula to do many things. To go drinking, to smoke weed, to look for any escape, to blame everybody. Eh? Drink your sorrows away, as they say. To get into unhealthy relationships, also as an escape, because it feels good that somebody told me that I'm good. Unfortunately, people in bad situations, all their decision making is terrible, tragic. Sometimes I see somebody in a bad situation, I just, my heart goes out for them. I say, let's make a deal. I can't heal you because I don't know how, I'm not God. But let me make the decisions for you for the next six months and then you'll go back to making your own. Because any decision you're going to make from now until the next six months is going to be tragic. Because under the circumstance that you are, you're going to make any decision that will get you out of pain. You won't make any rational decision. You won't make any correct decision, that's for sure. I said, and despite that, I never tell anybody what to do. I hate it by nature. I think people should be responsible for their own actions. But at least here, we'll prevent real tragedy. And relationships are the most common. Many relationships that very quickly end up being catastrophic on both ends happen for simple reasons. The boy was semi-desperate, the girl was semi-desperate. Desperation and desperation equal tragedy every single time. They would have been a lot better off being single. Every time. I have a lot of experience in this industry. In the fighting end of it, at least. I've seen hundreds of couples like that. And it always narrows down to the same story. Either one was very lonely, or desperate, or this, or grew up in an abusive environment, or uh, one of the desperation stories needed affection, love, something or the other, thought they would get it from the other person who was also screwed up, and boom, tragedy struck. Age is a factor as well, many things like that. Hashem Yachim. When people are desperate, they make bad choices. Here's a kid who's desperate and pain and angry. That's a terrorist, simply put. 
and has nothing to lose. Because he hates his life anyway. So he decides that he has to be good at something. What's he going to be good at? He, wa he wants money. He doesn't want to work his way up the ladder, like most of us do. So he's going into the stealing business. In San Francisco, not only in San Francisco, most of California, it's a legitimate job today. Up to $900 is not a crime. I know you don't believe me. Take out your phone now and check it. See if I'm right. You can't tell somebody. A guy walks into your store, steals $899. You can't even tell him anything. The cops don't even show up. They're sick. That's liberals. That's people who say, I'm not on your level. I'm not as spiritual as you. Or everybody should do their way. That's what it narrows down to. That's their way. Many chain stores, like Walgreens and others, shut down most of their stores in these cities. Because they're on the verge of bankruptcy from these stores. People stealing all day long. And these thieves have even a bigger chutzpah. They go to a store, they steal a few hundred bucks of stuff, and then go to another store to return it so they get money. I wish I was joking. This is what's going on now as we speak on the West Coast. This is what happens without Torah. People come crazy. It's a... Uh, yeah, no, maybe they're also going to complain about discrimination when they don't want to take the return. <laughs> well, it would be a legitimate thing. I'm sure some Harvard scholar will also write an article about it. And CNN would love to interview him. So he goes into the business of stealing. But he doesn't want to go breaking into houses, and that's too complicated. So he thought of a simple system. He's going to ride the train every morning from Tel Aviv to Haifa. It's about an hour. Six o'clock in the morning, people go onto the train. What's the first thing they do? They close their eyes and go to sleep. Perfect opportunity. Pickpocketing. Clean cash. No, almost no risk involved. And he starts. Day one, comes back with a lot of money. Day two, even more money. Day three, even more money. What do you do when you have an idea that makes a lot of money? You open a franchise. Mm -hmm. So now he takes other kids in his orphanage place and tells them, I'll train you in for commission. We'll have a network. And there's a pandemic in Israel, and it's not COVID. It's people missing their cash from their wallets every morning and every evening. Rush out. He becomes very successful at it. He's making tons of money. At this. And now this young kid, he's a leader. He feels good about himself. He has all these people following him, and he has tons of money. Time goes by, and the money that people carry on them in cash in general is not much. 100 shekels, 50 shekels, and Israel even less probably. And they want more money. Greed. So that's when they decide to start breaking into houses. Figured houses get jewelry, people keep more money at home. And they're good at that too. House after house after house after house. One day, I come to a house that they're going to break into, broad daylight. And he sees the name on the door. And the name on the door is the same last name as him. And the first name is Itzik, otherwise known as that's his uncle that he called a few, a few years before, Rav Hashanah, that hung up on him. And he looks at his guys and he says, guys, this house we're breaking into, but the rules here are different. We're not taking a thing. We're ransacking the whole house and we're leaving. Causing mass havoc and destruction. I'll explain you later why. Okay. Gangster big boss says, we listen to them. They go in, they destroy the house, they do whatever they can to make destruction everywhere. And right before he leaves, he takes a cardboard box, takes a marker that he found in one of the drawers, writes on it, in honor of my dear uncle Itzik, from your nephew Moshe, that you love so much. Leaves it on the kitchen counter, and they leave the house, close the door behind them. Time goes by, and stealing from regular houses is not enough for them too. Money they have, but now they need a thrill, right? People look for thrills in life. Shagum. So, what's the thrill? So if you steal, not from a regular person, if you steal from law enforcement, that's already, I beat the system all the way. So they went and picked a house of a wealthy judge in Israel and decided that they're going to break into the judge's house. <laughs> that's already a whole <laughs> new level of thrill. He's the guy who puts all the criminals in jail. We're going to show him that we're going to... Even his house we're going to get. And they thought they were going to do everything right. They studied when he leaves his house, when there's nobody there, when this, when that. They had it all down pat when they're doing it daytime that they'll be able to do it. Minus one little detail. They weren't aware that this judge was under threats, like most judges in Israel. 
And as a result, the Israeli secret services were protecting him. And the Israeli secret services have one rule. They see and they're not seen. So they didn't see them. No, the day and time comes that they're going in, they go into the house, and within 30 seconds, they got guys jumping on them, and the fun's over. Guy stands in front of a judge. He's a kid, an 18-year-old teenager. And the judge looks at him and says, uh, are you, did you do this and this? And he says, yes, guilty. And the judge no, felt bad. And he says, you're entitled to a lawyer. You don't have to plead guilty. Maybe we'll if you can't afford it, we'll give you a public defendant. He says, judge, I don't want a public defendant. I don't want a lawyer. I know what I'm doing. I'm guilty. This the judge never heard before. You don't just you know, voluntarily, that's crazy, at least cut a deal or something. No criminal record. Get a good deal. So the judge turns to him and says, kid, what's wrong with you? Nobody voluntarily incarcerates himself. Why are you doing this? And he looks at the judge straight to his face and in a very cold tone of voice says, because I have no life. So I actually think I would enjoy prison more than anything else. And the judge at that point understood we're dealing with a psychiatric case more than a criminal and says, what does that mean you have no life? And he rattles off his life story to, his li to the judge. My parents were died at a very young age and my grandmother raised me and then she died and I went to an orphanage and my only uncle that I had didn't even want to talk to me then, 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 then. And he says, judge, by the way, not only do I want to go to prison, I could actually help you guys. Most of the unsolved robberies that happened lately, it was all me. I could tell you exactly what day, what time, each place. And the police could stop wasting their money and their resources. So this story can only happen in Israel, because in America nobody has a heart like this. The judge realized that, oh, you're going to put him in prison for what? The revolving door that'll come out in five years and be a bigger gangster? A more educated one? So he says, sorry to disappoint you. For you, prison is not a punishment, it's actually a prize. So that we're definitely not going to do. Instead, we're going to put you in a rehabilitation program. Send you up north to Israel somewhere. You'll, go, you'll, be a, you'll work on a farm. And it's an environment that's therapeutic and so on. Hopefully it'll help you and you'll heal a little bit from all your trauma in life and whatever. And then you'll be able to integrate into normal society without breaking into houses. The kid wasn't so happy about it, but he didn't see that he had much choice. The legal system was on it. Whatever, he took the deal. And there is a program like this in Israel that exists. It happens to be an extremely pro successful program for rehabilitating criminals. And he goes there and he joins this program. And it's pretty much he become a farmer. Like, it's kibbutz. People naturally live that life. And then they take these troubled people in. And it's very therapeutic. They, they learn responsibility. They learn this. They learn all different things that they never learned with the way they were living. They learn care, compassion. People get attached to animals. Not me, but others. Um, yeah, right, they say a dog's man's best friend. In the United States, we invest more money in protecting dogs than humans, so we actually sincerely mean that when we say that. Um, honestly, I would prefer a dog being the president of the current situation, so uh, I don't disagree completely in this case. I know that it wasn't so politically correct, but, you know, I'm entitled. I sincerely mean that, by the way. Um, at least the dog is loyal, right? What's the dog's quality? Why do people want a dog as a pet? Loyal. Always looks back to his owner to see if he's satisfied. Unfortunately, our politicians don't even care to do that. They don't even care to satisfy their own voter base. So yeah, it would be better to have a dog. Literally. We, society, civilization would benefit more. But kids are, he's there, he goes up to this place, and yeah, they give him, he starts working with the cows. It's called the raftan. He milks cows. And, uh, that's, my, that's his new career. And he actually likes it. It's a secluded place in the mountains. and uh, He's alone. Nobody's bugging him. It's him and the animals. Has a nice family that he lives by. Nobody bothers him. He feels good for the first time. Feels a sense of belong. Many people walk around with terrible pain because they don't feel they belong anywhere. They feel they belong somewhere. And time goes by and he's doing well. Now in Israel, I wish it was everywhere, but in the majority of places, the Rabbanut gives a heksha. Right? Almost every Israeli product that you buy, if you look in the Hebrew letters, it says, Bechshar Rabbanut this, Rabbanut that. Again, I'm not here to endorse say, if it's reliable or not, but at least there's some form of heksha. Not restaurants, I'm talking about products. 
some milk, has a hechsha. If there's a hechsha, what does that mean? That a rabbi has to come there every day, Chalav Yisrael, a Jew has to be there to see. So there's this Hasidic rabbi from Jerusalem who's coming up north every day to check out this milk farm. And he's the one who's interacting with this Moshe boy. And every day the same routine. Good morning, how are you? How are you, rabbi? Everything good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The formalities. Ask him a few questions. This, that, the other. Super, everything's good. Check. Signs off on it. Leaves. One day this rabbi was in the Kirov. He was a Belzer Chassid. Belzer was very, very into Kirov. And he said to himself, he's a not religious kid, he looks young, and he looks like a good person. And that that he's here, okay, so he made mistakes in life, but uh, let's help him, maybe we can bring him closer to the Hashem. So he starts talking to him, starts being nicer to him, tries slowly to develop a relationship with him. Until he felt comfortable enough, and one afternoon he calls him over and he says, Moshe, by lunch break I want to sit with you a little bit, let's have coffee together, eat together lunch. By then, he was already acquainted with this rabbi, so he wasn't going to say no. He said, fine, rabbi, you want, no problem. They sit down together, and he tells him straight out, he said, I'm not going to beat around the bush. This place is meant for criminals. You're not a criminal. He said, I've been observing you for months now. You're a good person. How'd you end up here? And he said, what do you mean, how'd I end up here? I was one of the biggest thieves in Israel. I even broke into the judge's house. How did I end up here? He said, but it doesn't, it's, the story doesn't add up. You're not, you don't show any of those character traits. Doesn't make sense. And that's when Moshe breaks down and tells him his whole life story and his anger and pain and resentment and this and that and spills it all out to the rabbi. The rabbi hears the whole story and vows to himself that he's going to be the one that's going to help this guy. No, it's a big project to help a boy like this, but... And he starts, every time he comes to the milk farm, instead of being there for 20 minutes, he's suddenly there for 30, because 10 minutes is devoted to bringing something for Moshe, one day a cake, one day this, one day that, just to give him a sense of norm, family, love. As time goes by, a little, teaches him a little Torah, offers him a pair of tefillin, gives him some sense of reason and norm. By he ayom, one day, comes to this Moshe and he says, listen, in a few weeks, it's going to be a yard site of a famous Hasidic Rebbe, Habeli Melech Milozhensk. And I'm going to the grave of where this rabbi is buried. And it's a very special place, very good energy there. Maybe you want to come with me. You never left Israel in your life. It'll be an opportunity. You'll go out of Israel a little bit. Come with me. I'll pay for everything. I'll take care of everything you come with. And this Moshe looks at the rabbi and laughs at him and says, I should come with you? I'm a criminal. I'm on probation. I can't leave Israel for years. I can't do it. He says, Moshe, you obviously don't know Hasidim. We know how to work everything out. You leave it up to us. So he so didn't believe that it's possible that they're going to let him leave Israel. So he tells this rabbi, if you get me a court of thing that says that I could go with you out of Israel, I'm going. He later on said, when he said over the story, he never said it because he wanted to go. He didn't want to go. It was against his nature. But he just thought it was so crazy. He said, why? This rabbi is his friend. Why should he say no to his friend? He'll say, yeah, and it won't work, and goodbye. Leave it up to the Bells of Hasidim. They have a representative in the Knesset, and from there to Sarah Mishpatim, and from there to the judge, and lo and behold, a couple of days later, there's a passport with a thing that says that he could leave Israel. And with a rabbi that put his house as collateral that he's going to bring him back to Israel too, by the way. See a snippet to save a Jewish child. And he takes him with him. And not only do they go to Lejans, they go on a whole tour of Kivet Sadikim all over Europe, to this grave, that grave. He saw every dead, man, every dead rabbi that exists in Europe. And this, Belzer Chos, didn't want him to be bored, right? The whole idea was they should have a nice time. So he did it in a good way. Every place he explained to him who the rabbi was, what his legacy was, what the history was, when he lived. And like that, he also snuck in a little bit Torah, his teachings, his this, place after place after place. I do many of these tours over the years throughout Europe. I can tell you way more than we accomplish in years of speeches. One Europe tour accomplishes in changing people. It's unreal. Five days in Europe and people that were angry, miserable, and stupid, suddenly normal, healthy, functioning Torah. Turnaround. It's amazing the impact these things have.
You take them to the camps, to here, to there. You, know, you just have to know how to give it over the right way. And he takes them from one place to another place and from another place to another place. And the final stop in Europe that they go to is a grave that today, due to wars, you can't go right now. But hopefully soon the wars will calm down and we'll be able to go again. Or we'll see him by Tchiat HaMetim. I think that might have them first. I believe Yitzchak ben Tzayos Hashem Yibaditra Zechot Tzadik Vachas Chotei Again Aleinu The Baditra And he tells them about the Baditra And how the Baditra only saw good in people And everything he saw he always, uh, And even when it didn't look good He turned it into something good And all the famous stories about the Baditra That we don't have to repeat now And he's all impressed And then he turns to Moshe and he says Moshe listen You have a lot of anger in your heart And you can't find any good You can't get any answers so this is an opportunity to pray. Until now, I didn't tell you to pray. But to pray is probably hard for you too. Because you're angry at God, you're angry, you're angry at everybody. And rightfully so. So why don't you take a piece of paper and write down what it is that you wish would happen. And leave it by the rabbi's grave. And Moshe turns to this guy and says, Rabbi, do you think the dead rabbi is reading my paper? He says, I don't know. But what do you care? You have nothing to lose. If he doesn't read it, so... You didn't believe in it anyway. And if he does read it, so then it might work for you. He caught it, liked it. Fine, takes a note. I don't know what was there, more ink or tears, but he writes a whole letter to the rabbi, as they say. He didn't even realize that a keva of a tzaddik is a mean to get that Hashem. It's not the rabbi. He didn't know that, poor kid. He wrote the letter to the rabbi, folded it up, sealed it, put it by the body of his keva. That's the first time he shows any emotion. He cried when he wrote the letter. Sometimes when a person shows emotion, it's actually a sign that he's beginning to heal. The rabbi is satisfied. They go to the airport, they fly back to Israel. They land back in Israel, Pshat Tovah, and instead of him going back to his farm and the rabbi going back to his family, the rabbi tells him, we have a few more stops to make. He says, what stops? He said, until now you saw all the dead people in Europe, now I want you to see one of the dead people in Israel. He says, rabbi, enough with graves. Anything to do with lives? He said, you said you're antisocial. You don't like people. So dead people, they don't talk to you. You don't talk to them. It's perfect. He takes them to Shechem. Don't go there today. It's dangerous. But we used to be able to go. To the grave of Yosef HaTzadik. And again, as he did every time, he told them the history. He tells Yosef HaTzadik, had 11 brothers. They, well, at that time, it was less. It was, ten, it was nine brothers. Um, they sold him because they were jealous of him. And later on, he became the ruler of Egypt. The brothers had to come down to get food for him. and Tells him the whole story. And then he says, and after Yaakov Avinu passed away, the brothers were scared that he would take revenge. And the brothers told him, Atem chashavtem you thought you were doing me bad, harming me. But God had a great plan. Look, that I became the ruler and I was able to feed everybody and do all these great things. And he says, meaning that was the ultimate level of forgiveness, that not only didn't he fight his brothers and look for revenge against those who harmed him, he actually helped them. You know what a hard thing that is to do? To help somebody who harmed you? I have that test many times, unfortunately. People have betrayed you, but to help them anyway, because they're in need. It's very hard. But it's such an elevating feeling. It's so gratifying that it's priceless. There's no way to explain the satisfaction. That's when you know you're in full control of your action. You, can't get, you don't get deterred by anything. And he turns to this Moshe and he says, it's true that your uncle backstabbed you and it's true that your parents died but maybe you should consider forgiving and letting go because at the end of the day your parents are dead your grandmother's dead and they didn't mean to die God took them so being angry at them is for sure pointless your uncle who knows he was in a fight with your father for years before God knows what went on oh yes so none of them are suffering the only person that's suffering is you so let go and you won't suffer anymore. Forgive. He listens. He doesn't buy it so much. And it goes on. And he moves on. He continues on. He says, no, now we're go I'm going back home already. I'm going to the farm. He missed the cows, I guess. He said, no, we're going to make one more stop. He said, one more. Don't tell me another dead one. He said, no, until now we went to those who are dead. Now we're going to go to those who are about to die. He said, where are you taking me now? He said, I'm taking you to an old age home. He said, what do I have to do in an old age home exactly? So the rabbi tells him, I have this thing, I volunteer once a week. That I go to this old age home and I hang out with the people, I sing for them, I dance for them. 
they're lonely, they're alone, they're, they're not young anymore, to bring some life, you know, some simcha into their life, some joy into their life. And because we were in Europe and that, I wasn't there. And I'm sure they're worried about me and they miss me, so I think I want to go. Boy, should join me, let's go to the old age and we'll be Misamech Eden and we'll make Eden happy. Okay, the kid says, Rabbi, this is the last stop, right? After this, we're done. It was, a, you know, it was very nice, but it was a long week. He says, yeah, last stop. Fine. They go to this old age, and the rabbi walks in together with this kid. By then he's, you know, in his teen, high teens, almost done his teenage years. And everybody's so happy to see the rabbi. Rabbi, welcome, we didn't see you, where were you, this, that. You know, these people, it's their simcha in life. It's their simcha in life. Maybe there's a time to sidetrack for a second and say if any of you have old grandparents or great-grandparents, calling them or visiting them is what keeps them alive in this world. That's not an exaggeration, that's literal. Besides the ethical obligation, think about the impact. And also remember one day, hopefully you'll grow old. And you're going to be in their position. And you're going to want your grandchildren to do that. Take the time to recognize them. Take the time to shower them with love, to give them a good word, to play a game with them, to go on a walk with them, whatever it is. No matter what. I used to spend hours with my grandfather that passed away recently, talking to him about whatever he wanted. One day it was business, one day it was Lahav del Gemara, one day it was types of scotch, one day it was... It gave him chius, it gave him life when he was in the hospital, very, towards the end of his life, before the hospital killed him. Um, he told the only person that was allowed to be with him because of the COVID regulations that uh, he doesn't feel he has the fight in him anymore because his grandchildren are not with him to talk to. This is pikuach nefesh. It's literally pikuach nefesh for them. It's a life and death matter. It's a serious thing. And Stam, I remember as a child in Muncie, we were raised. It was a normal thing. That was the way it was. That on Shabbat, all the boys and girls when we were young kids, we were 8, 10, went to the old age homes. There was a Jewish old age home, one on Maple Avenue, one somewhere else, and spent the whole afternoon there, every single week. We didn't go to sleep, we didn't play games. It was a no-brainer. They need company, they need entertainment, we were, and we would go. And if I would tell you how much I gained from it, how many stories these Holocaust survivors told me and things that I carry with myself till today, how many life lessons I learned, I thought I was doing them a favor. As an adult, I could say, they, they taught me life at a young age. But it would take me years and years and years to maybe get to on my own. I got a 10 years old spoon fed to me. Unbelievable. Kids, uh, they go to this old age room. And everybody's excited to see the rabbi. And, uh, who's this guest with you? He's my friend. And, uh, sit in a circle. The rabbi takes out a guitar. They say he starts singing some songs for them. And he sings this one song. When he's done the song, some old guy that's sitting there says, Rabbi, can you sing it again? So he sings it again. He's done the second time, the old guy again. Rabbi, can you sing it one more time? Just one more time. This Moshe already, wants, you know, he's tired and cranky after flights and dead people and graves and whatever. He wants to get out of there. Again, 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 it's boring. So he gets frustrated and he's sitting near this old man and he turns to him and he says, Dude, can you let the rabbi move on already? How many times does he have to sing the same song for you? It's boring. And the guy doesn't turn to the boy. With a straight face, he answers him, That's all I have in my life. So Moshe laughs him off. He says, you're an old man. You had a good life. I'm the one who has problems in life. And he sees an interesting thing. The gentleman is not turning to him. Not only when he talks to somebody, you look at them. His head's straight. And he answers him again. He says, you want to match stories, son? We can match stories. He says, sure, let's match stories. He says, you're the young ones. Are your stories shorter? You start first. And Moshe starts. I was born to wonderful parents when I was eight years old. My father and mother died a few months apart. I was raised by my grandmother, who was an amazing person, loved, cared, me, cared for me, but sure enough, she got sick. A couple years later, she died too. I was placed in an orphanage. The situation wasn't so good. One day we found out that I had an uncle, and the social worker thought it was a good idea for me to get to know my uncle. She made, worked on it for a long time. I was all excited. Every Rosh I picked up the call. I called my uncle Itzik, and I told him, it's your nephew Moshe on the phone. He said, yes, how could I help you? I was shocked that he didn't even care to ask me how I'm doing. 
I said, well, I, I called to wish you a Shana Tava. He hung up the phone. He said Shana Tava and hung up the phone. I vowed revenge and left. I later on became a thief. I started with pickpocketing, then breaking into houses, then this, then that. He tells him the whole story. Till one day I broke into a judge's home, got caught, was sent to this rehabilitation program. In this rehabilitation program, I met this rabbi. This rabbi befriended me. I actually liked him. It's the first human that I get along with since my parents and grand grandmother died. And just dragged me on a trip to Europe and now dragged me to sit near you. Is that a horrific enough life story for you? And the old man says, that's actually a very interesting story, my son. Now let me tell you mine. I had wonderful parents. They raised me and my brother. We all, there were only two boys in our family. At a very young age, my father died. I left an inheritance. My mother stayed alive. My mother was alive. But in the inheritance, he says that the kids should inherit the businesses. There were two businesses. I took one. My brother took the other. Mine did very well. My brothers didn't do that well. And my brother was jealous of me, and the fight started. He hated me. In return, I was angry at him for hating me over what I never did wrong. All we did was had an agreement, and he had bad luck, and I had good luck. And for many, many, many years, we didn't talk. To the point that when he died, I wasn't even aware of it. Later on, one day, I heard my mother died. And even that I heard indirectly because my mother sided with my brother and not with me and had no contact with my family. I was very financially successful, but family I never had. I never was married, never had children because I was married to my business and that was my whole focus in life. One day somebody reaches out to me, a social worker from some sort of orphanage and tells me that lo and behold I have a nephew who lost his parents and his grandmother, otherwise known as my brother and my mother, and he has nobody in the world and asked me if I would be willing to speak to the child. I told her I have no idea because I don't know if the child wants to be in contact with me and she assured me that he knows nothing about the past and of course he would be happy to have a family member in his life. As the plans for this great meeting was happening and I was so excited to have somebody in the world that was related to me, I got involved with a Brazilian businessman in a business deal, things went sour, he got very angry at me and vowed to have me killed. I realized his threats were serious and it's Eight o'clock in the morning, Erev Shanai was tipped off that in half an hour, the mafia is going to be at my house to kill me. I decided I have no choice but to escape. I took my passport and the cash I had in the house and was standing by the door in order to go to the airport to fly out of Israel until I figured things out. And as I was at the door, the phone was ringing. I was scared of maybe the mafia or something or the other. I wanted to gauge where I was at. I picked up the phone and lo and behold, it was my nephew. But my life was at stake and I had no choice and I had to run. I wished him a Shana Tava, I left the house, I went to the airport and I flew to another country. I lived in that country for a few years, couldn't resolve the issues in business, couldn't pay back this guy, until one day the guy located where I was in the world, sent the local gang after me, they came and he warned them not to kill me but to torture me. They poured acid over me. He said, you know why I don't look at you when I talk to you? Because I'm blind, I can't see. I was brought back in critical condition to Israel, treated in a hospital for many months, and a few weeks ago put into this assisted living facility in order to get help. And I promised myself that as soon as I have the physical strength, I will look for my nephew, Moshe, and I will reach out to him and tell him I'm sorry that that day I couldn't answer his call. I was just trying to stay alive, but I love him, and for the last little amount of time I have in life, I want to be there for him. And then he says, Moshe, Will you shake my hand? Days, weeks, months went by. This Moshe now has family, goes to visit his uncle every day almost. And this seems to be somewhat of a happy ending to the story. One day, he gets a phone call. Your uncle's in critical condition, race to the hospital before it's too late. He leaves the kibbutz that he's in, he takes a taxi, he goes to the hospital. He gets to the hospital and he sees his uncle breathing his last breaths, says goodbye and watches him pass from the world. They have a small funeral, he didn't have family or anybody, and he's buried. And at the funeral, a gentleman taps him on the shoulder and says, you're his nephew? And he said, yes. He said, my name is attorney so-and-so. Please come to my office when Shiva is over. He said, I'm a nephew, I'm not a son, I'm not sitting Shiva. He said, so then come tomorrow or whenever you feel up to it. And he gives him a business card. Looks at the address and he goes, Shows up to the attorney. The attorney tells him, your uncle didn't have much, but whatever he did own in this world, he left as an inheritance for you. 
you have to sign some documents, so I'll tell you what there is and how to get it and whatever, and uh, with that I fulfill my job. And he says, sure, what is there? And he tells him a little bit of money here, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, pension, life insurance, whatever, and a house. And he hands him keys and a deed to a house. Moshe goes to see his house. He opens the door, sees a house that was ransacked completely, walks into the kitchen and sees a cardboard to my uncle Itzik from your nephew Moshe that loves you so much. What you do good, you do good to yourself. What you do bad, you do bad to yourself. The grudges you hold, you're going to pay a price for. Nobody else. Yes, a lot of things in life don't make sense. Now. But if only you would give life a chance to show you the big picture. If only you would care enough to find out the whole story. Everything would make sense. I'm not that old. I can't say, I hope to live to be old. Hashem should give me health. But in my limited years, I'm old in a different way. That I sat with, I don't know the number for sure, but definitely way past 15,000, but probably way, way more than that, people and heard their life stories. So I saw life 15,000 times from different angles in the most personal way. And I've learned that life makes a lot of sense. And that we dictate our destiny, we dictate our choices, we dictate our future, we dictate where we're going to be one day, and we do it all by the simplistic decisions we make every day on how we behave. To the point that even the bad moods we're in all the time, we choose to be in. I'm not talking about chemical depressions, it's a separate subject. But beside, beyond that, a person, Hashem gave him the ability to take full control and destiny of his life. There's no need for meds, there's no need for substances, there's no need for escapes, there's no need for alcohol, there's no need for anything. Hashem gave a person the ability in his mind to fight and overcome anything and everything that exists. But not always do you see the whole picture. Now, you don't see the whole picture, it's very hard to appreciate a situation. And I'll end off with a very personal story. I hope my daughter doesn't get upset at me for sharing this, but I think the message is so powerful that she'll have to forgive me. It was right before Passover, and she was in the house for Passover, or for the first part of it at least. And she comes to me, you know, when she moved in for the holiday, and uh, shows me a ring. Says, Daddy, you like my new ring? It was a nice ring, I'm not going to say. But, you know, okay, I've seen many expensive things in life. I come from a family that, on my wife's side, is uh, very powerful in the jewelry industry, let's just say. So it's hard to impress me. She says, my husband bought it for me. So of course I'm going to make a big deal at that point. Wow, amazing, so beautiful. Yeah. World's greatest ring. Happens to be a nice ring, I'm not saying not. But <laughs> whatever, you know, like, it's not like she came with an expensive Patek Philippe or something. Yeah. It's a ring. And, but I like the idea. I said, oh, Hashem, Hashem gave my daughter a husband that understands that a wife needs gifts and recognition and whatever. And, cared enough to go do that, right? That's what, that's what was important to me. But now I want to analyze for a second. When I looked at her hand, when she stuck out, Daddy, do you like my ring? What did I see? Diamonds and gold. And a caring husband. That's what I saw. Which is beautiful, but that's all I saw. And two minutes later, I hear something that blew my mind away to a point that I'm willing to spend Insane numbers that she should sell me her ring, and she's not willing to sell it to me. She could buy a house plus. That's how much this ring is now worth to me. My son wasn't cold. So of course I support them, I pay their bills, whatever. It's a no-brainer, that's my schus. And I, o I always tell him, you have an open check, whatever, you know. If you want to buy my daughter anything, just... There's always daddy's credit card available, it's fine. He, on his own, decided that that doesn't mean anything. It has no value at that point. I bought you a gift on your father's expense. Uh, what's the value in that? But he learns. He doesn't work, so he has no income. So how could he buy his wife a gift not from daddy's credit card? So for close to two years, 
He's been taking all these extra tests from all these dirshu and other program, incentive programs and writing all these chaburas and submissions to Svarim and learning quotas of the daf and other things. $30 for this one, $60 for that one, $20 for that one, $80 for that one. Saving, 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 saving to get to a few thousand dollars. And when he finally got to a few thousand dollars, reached out to one of our wholesalers and got a ring. That's not a ring. That's not diamonds and gold. That's thousands of hours of learning. That's hundreds of hours of Mesilut Nefesh of a Kailo guy that says just because I chose to live a life of learning doesn't mean my wife should be deprived of a gift. That's not $3,000 or $4,000. That's millions of dollars. It's priceless. I told this to one of my close friends. He's a very wealthy man. He told me, I give her a million bucks right now for the ring. And he meant it. I told my daughter, you want a million bucks? You could buy a house with it. I said, are you crazy? I said, there's no money in the world. I said, do you sell your Ganadin for a million dollars? I said, this is my seal of Ganadin that I chose, even though I was raised in a very comfortable home, to live a different life for the sake of marrying a bentoa. To go from a huge house to a two-bedroom basement apartment. Because Torah is more important. Just when you see something, understand that what you're seeing is not what it really is. Take the time and make the effort to look in the background story of what, what it really means. And then you'll begin to get an understanding of life. When you begin to understand, then you feel more whole with life. When you feel more whole, you're not angry, miserable, resentful, or jealous. And then you don't have to behave in unethical ways to others. And at that point, yes, the 48 ways of acquiring Torah are relatively easy to acquire and could be done in seven weeks. And you can have a matan Torah. Thank you very much.